All right, let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for another Lord's Day to come together and to worship you and to receive from your word and from all your means of grace. We pray for your blessing on this class that it would be edifying to us as we consider these last things, these uh, final points of your good news. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're at question 38 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And uh, we have a little bit of a luxury this time. We don't have to go as long anyway, so if I run out of time for my notes, the next topic next month for the Q&A is the new heavens and new earth. So whatever we don't cover, um, we can cover then. But here's the question, question 38. What benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? Answer, at the resurrection, believers being raised up to glory shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment and made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God to all eternity. So four basic points. We're going to look at resurrection, glorification, vindication. That's my way of wrapping up a couple of phrases that are in there. And then what's often referred to as the beatific vision, if we get there. So... Uh, the resurrection, the first part, is going to be the biggest part because there's a lot to talk about. Um, if you were to look in Revelation 20, and maybe that's a good passage to turn to, Revelation 20, I'm not going to read it, but just for your reference, uh, verses uh, 1 through 6, and you should do this sometime, open up a Bible to Revelation 20, 1 through 6, and the other, I don't know, another Bible, or just your other hand, in John 5, 25 through 29. Do yourself a favor and do that sometime and compare them. And you will suddenly see yourself being an amillennialist. I mean, no, well, you will. But um, just do that sometime and you'll, you'll see something that you might not have seen before. Several things, actually. But um, this passage, this idea of the resurrection that we're talking about here in this answer is distinguished from what Revelation 20 calls the first resurrection. Now, it doesn't call the other resurrection anything. It just anticipates it. It sort of mentions it by, I don't want to say default, but by implication, those that, that wait till the end of this period. Okay? Well, the question, though, is in what way is it distinguished from the first resurrection? Because everybody there can see the words first resurrection. The question is, how is it different? Well, in premillennialism, one actually has to posit two general resurrections. In other words, resurrections at the end. The first resurrection has to happen at the rapture, where the righteous who are in the graves and those who are alive, uh, who are left alive together with them, this is 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, go to meet the Lord in the air. But then this separates the raising of the wicked until after the thousand years which follow. Now, nobody disputes that the second resurrection follows that period. That, that's clear in the passage itself, since Revelation 20, verse 5 plainly says so. The question, though, hinges on the meaning of that thousand years, on the meaning of that resurrection. One of the, things, one of the reasons I have you open John 5 also is to show you that it also hinges, hinges on the meaning of first resurrection. Are there other passages that can help us understand what's meant by the first resurrection. Because I think we can also all agree that the first resurrection applies only for believers. Which, which believers? We could talk about that, but it applies only for believers. Well, there are other verses that show how all believers are raised with Christ within the power of the first resurrection. Here's a couple. I mentioned John 5, 24 and 25. But also look at Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, Colossians 3, 1, and 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4. And if you look at those verses, you'll see that being born again is equated to being raised with Christ. Not in some ethereal, analogical way, but in a real sense. Now, there are debates even among amillennialists whether that first resurrection then means 
um, maybe the new birth is the first fruit of it, and what it really means is when you die, that you're raised in the intermediate state. Um, I would take the other view that it actually just starts and means uh, at the new birth. And one of the reasons I would take that to mean that, besides those verses, which I think are clearer than anything about the intermediate state, is that in those verses and in two others, if you factor in Philippians 3.20 and Revelation 1.7, in all of those passages, there is the sense where Paul is speaking to people alive on earth right now, presently reigning and ruling with him. You are seated where he is. You do reign with him. You do wait now from heaven for this revelation. And so um, I would take the first resurrection to be synonymous with the new birth. Um, not all, all millennialists would. Some would see that, again, as the intermediate state. But whatever, in either case, there's not two second comings of Christ surrounding two general resurrections at the end. That just You can't support that. And you could see why in Revelation 20 they, they do say that. They just look at the whole thing chronological, together with the whole book being chronological, which has just all sorts of problems. As a side note, it's often said that premillennialism was the doctrine of the earliest church. There's two fairly massive problems with repeating that over and over again, as we often hear. You know, didn't Papias and Polycarp, I mean, they were, you know, they were disciples of John himself, and John wrote Revelation. Okay, yes, but show me their treatises that talked about eschatology as a whole as a big subject. Oh, yeah, there are none. So what's happening is people are taking one or two um, sentences from early church fathers, not measuring them up against any other sentences and saying that that's the doctrine of the early church, and, hey, they're the guys that knew John. Okay, well, you just um, put together a truism with something else that's completely exaggerated. The first um, definitive or extended statement about the nature of the millennium that we see is at the end of the city of God with Augustine. And there you have a figurative treatment of the millennium. In addition to that, the Apostles' Creed, which we have to date earlier than any such writings, and which was confessed universally by Christians, says that Christ sits at the right hand of God, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And as W.G.T. Shedd comments on that line, quote, the doctrinal statement of the Apostles' Creed consequently precludes a premillennial advent of Christ. And the idea there is that he comes from that judgment seat and judges the righteous and the wicked. And as I'm about to show you, I'll show you texts where the righteous and the wicked are raised on the same day for the judgment. But there is a general resurrection on the last day. And the Jews had always been taught that, even in the Old Testament. You'll often hear that from skeptics. There is no doctrine of the resurrection in the Old Testament. You'll even hear biblical scholars. I, don't, I would question their scholarly credentials if they do this. So the resurrection, well, of course, just like anything else, it's not as clear in the Old Testament as it is in the New. But why do you think that Abraham was looking for a grave for Sarah? And why do you think Joseph had them take his bones from Egypt back to Israel? And all these different things. Isaiah 26, 19, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You shall dwell in the dust, uh, you who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. I read the Job passage last week about his expectation of resurrection. Daniel 12, 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. By the way, why would a simple Jewish woman named Martha have said to Jesus, we know that at the resurrection, what's she talking about? Well, she's talking about what every Jew knew, that there was a resurrection at the end of time. So, no, uh, the Old Testament does not not have a doctrine of the resurrection. It totally has a doctrine of the resurrection. And about that last day, if somebody asks, you know, what's the difference between this coming of Christ and judging and raising the righteous and the wicked, what's the difference between that and and the rapture. And um, my answer to that is properly defined, no difference at all. What you're referring to is the rapture. Uh, oh, you guys don't believe the rapture. Well, it depends what you mean. We do believe in the rapture. Namely, we believe that Christ is coming again, and He's coming bodily and visibly, and, and, he's, and he's bringing with Him all who are His, and He's raising out of the grave. If, if that's all the things that you mean by rapture, yes. If, if by that you mean a secret event that He whisks away the um, believers secretly, and then followed by a seven and ten year tribulation and so on, 
um, for a second second coming of Christ and said, well, no, you got that from fiction books from the last 30, 40 years. And then we read that into Scripture when, in fact, there's no verse in Scripture uh, that says anything like that. So what do we find when we look at the passages on the Lord's return? Because I think there are some things that are clear. I'll mention six things, six things in particular that stand out about passages on the Lord's return. And these are things that are sort of repeated in several of the passages. Number one, it's at a time that is unknown and unexpected. You know, the parable of the, of the virgins, a time you, like a thief in the night. Or Jesus saying, no one knows, Matthew 24, 30. Or Acts 1, 7, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons. Or 2 Peter 3, 10, where you have, you know, what sort of lives should you leave? In other words, because you don't know when the Lord could come at any time. So one thing that's very clear is that no one knows the exact, as far as us down here on earth. Number two, it will be visibly and bodily. Christ will return visibly and bodily. We see that in Acts chapter 1, in the same manner that I go up and He's coming down, visibly and bodily, and in such a way that every eye shall see Him. Revelation 1.7, again, 1.9. I messed that verse up, but it's in, Revel- in those verses in Revelation 1, that every eye shall see Him, even those who pierced Him. How's that possible? He's raising them, remember? Oh, they're going to see Him. And that's what Revelation is talking about by all those that opposed Him, crying out to the rocks and the mountains to hide them. They, these, these are people crying out to be crushed by the earth, anything, to escape the wrath of the Lamb. Third, this is happening at the loud sounds of a trumpet and even the call of angels. We see the, the trumpet in three passages, Matthew 25, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4. Are you thinking this talk about the same event, maybe? Trumpets come, you know, as, as he's coming back to this and loud call of angels. Where else do we see that? What about all the parables? The parable of the net, the parable of the weeds. When he says, don't separate them now, who will do so at the end? The angels. Or before the high priest in Mark 14, when he says, this, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with his angels. So you see a pattern. The angels and at the sound of trumpets. Now, is that literal trumpets? We don't. I know one thing. Trumpets are not quiet. Trumpets are loud. That's why trumpets are picked. So whether it's literal or figurative, the imagery is meant to suggest not secret event. Fourth, Christ himself descends, and he's the one. And it, there's a verse that talks about his, uh, his call or cry of command. So even, now what does this look like? The trumpets and the angels are maybe the manifestation, or maybe they go before him as he calls. I don't know, but I know that Christ himself calls out. Again, John 5 would back that up, verse 28 and 29, that it's his call, his calling out to the graves, that all who are in the graves will come out at the sound of what? At the sound of his command. Five, this is what that call does. To all of those who are dead in the graves, the righteous and the wicked, they rise together. So you see that in the Olivet Discourse, that they're judged on the same day, and in John 5, 28, that he resurrects all of those on the same day, the righteous and the wicked. Again, you know, I'm not trying to ruin anybody's time reading end times fiction, but it was fiction. That stuff about a secret rapture that just... um, By the way, let me me cut in here. Um, You'll often hear, you know, well, God always removes His people from judgment. Okay, you got a couple problems there. Um, Yes, He removes them from judgment, you are equating tribulation to judgment, and tribulation does not equal judgment. There's no more condemnation. But Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Through many tribulations in Acts uh, 14, you must enter the kingdom. So we're promised tribulation. What about the tribulation? Well, I don't know. What about Revelation 1-9 when John opens up the book by saying, I, John, partner with you in the tribulation. So you know, A, you're equating judgment to tribulation. They're not equated. And then saying that uh, Christians, um, God doesn't put us through tribulation. Um, Imagine being a non-American 
in the third world during the modern era when the kind of Christianity that America has accepted in the last hundred years, that we, that we export that to the mission field, and we present this rosy, glowing, God is here to keep you from tribulation. How are you hearing that if you're a third world Christian? You know, Amer- I've, I've talked about eschatology to people and had the response, okay, where's the tribulation then? the tribulation, there are more Christians dying in the world right now than in all eras of the past combined. Where's the tribulation? You're in it. But we live in Disneyland. A little blip. A little blip on the screen. Um, So it's very... we, We live in tunnel vision. And that's why we've accepted these fictions from the last hundred years. Um, number six, Christ defeats all of his enemies who inhabit the earth at that time. I uh, read uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10, and, um, and those passages in Revelation 19 and 20. That's what he's coming back for. Um, he's coming back visibly, bodily, raising up everyone, and all of the elect that he removes, he then destroys all of his enemies. And that happens suddenly, with no warning, with no second chance. Um, That's the picture presented in these passages. So, if that is true, this does not give us warrant to separate these into two or more events. Um, So I basically paraphrased all those passages, but uh, so I won't read them in their entirety, but just study those passages and you'll see those common threads. Now, not all of those attributes that I mentioned are in every single one of those passages. But I think you'll see that all of those attributes are at least in three or more of those passages. And that's the key, is that you start seeing that pattern and you realize, okay, these are not three or four or five separate events. These are different aspects of the one second coming of Christ. So there's a lot of mystery about the resurrection, but the fact that it is a bodily resurrection, just as Christ's was, is beyond dispute. So those undisputable facts then bring us to undisputable fact about our own resurrection. That's the promise here. So 1 Corinthians 15, verses 43 and 44, uh, when the question becomes, well, what kind of body are we talking about here? And uh, one of the things Paul says is that it is sown in dishonor, body. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. By the way, spiritual body does not mean non-body. You know, people say, will say that all the time. They'll, they'll hang on to this idea of that we're going to heaven rather than a new heavens and new earth. And we can talk about the role that heaven plays. That We'll do that in a Q&A night. But um, as far as our own beings, our own constitution... A spiritual and glorified body is at least a body. And, and Jesus gives us a foretaste of that at least in uh, post-resurrection appearances. I say foretaste. I'm not suggesting that that's the sum and whole of it, but it's at least a foretaste of that. Um, and so while there's a lot we don't know, there's a lot here to believe that we often fall short of. And why do we fall short of it? Well, Jesus said to the Sadducees in Matthew 22, 29, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. Now, they were rank unbelievers, I realize that, but what they were guilty of is something that we could be guilty of in our thinking. A lot of our unbelieving thoughts really come down to this. As Paul knew when he preached the gospel to the Gentiles in Acts 26, verse 8, he says, Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? So Paul is preaching that as part of the gospel, not just that Christ was raised and that proves who he was, And it does do that, but it's also a first fruit of something that we are guaranteed. Thomas Boston, in his uh, book on human nature in its fourfold state, reaches that last state, and he commented on our falling short of faith in God's resurrection power. He says, an inferior nature has but a very imperfect conception of the power of a superior. Brutes do not conceive of the actings of reason in men, 
and men have but imperfect notions of the power of angels. How low and inadequate a conception, then, must a finite nature have of the power of that which is infinite? And then he uses this series of analogies, the apothecary, knowing which medicines are in his shop and where they came from. Here he's dealing with stuff like we did last time, like cremation and things like that. Well, how will God, you know, raise uh, people who haven't received a proper burial? Well, when they've been given a burial, their bodies deteriorate too. And the point is, is that God does not have a problem here recollecting all the molecules and stuff. That's what Boston's getting at. He, he talks about an expert gardener being able to distinguish between his seeds and the watchmaker taking up several pieces of his watch from a con confused heap before him. He's able to put back together each in their proper place. How much more then can God, who once created all this from nothing, distinguish between something and something? No matter how far apart or lost we think it is, it's not to God. So that's the resurrection. Uh, then brings, that brings glorification. And this is the transition from the intermediate state we looked at last week to the eternal state. So we read passages like this, and I mentioned this, Philippians 3, 20 and 21, but there's stuff about glorification here too. He says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await. It's already very interesting language. Look at that. Our citizenship is in heaven. From it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our, spelling error, our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. And what I want to concentrate on there is glorious body. That's Paul's theme at the end of um, 1 Corinthians 15. It's also hinted in Romans 8, 20 through 25 when we look at creation is going to be restored. At the center of that, Paul is placing man the revealing of the sons of God, the, re the, the uh, redemption of our bodies. The doctrine of glorification teaches this very thing. The saints will be raised up to glory. So that's in the answer in this catechism. Raised up to glory. This is the final element of salvation. This is part of the gospel in which the saints behold Christ as He is and so are finally conformed to His image. And this happens... Uh, either at death, and we talked about that, the, uh, that's not the full thing, but the, we talked about last week, the, uh, I forgot the phrase that was used, but the perfected in holiness part, that part at least that sin is done away with at glorification. Uh, but then when the Lord returns, you have the body and the soul reunited, and now you have a glorified soul. It's not like you have just a glorified soul, but not a glorified body, like um, you know, I know I will not sin, but I mean, come on, my body, well, you're, all of the ravages of sin, all of the things that had to do with the curse, these are done away with as well. And of course, if you put it that way, that's very good news. Uh, 1 John 3, 2, uh, we're going to read this because we've looked at 2 Corinthians 3, 18, that the way that we become glorified, well, let me back up. The way we become sanctified in this life is by beholding that same image, that same glory. We, we become like little g, little g, little glory, more glory progressively. But then on that day, that same principle, here's what John says. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. So we talked about that principle, that you become what you behold. This is true of sin and idolatry, but it's true of glory as well. That you have all at once, what Paul was saying happens little by little. John is saying happens all at once by looking at Christ and beholding Him. All sin vanishes. Glory perfects virtue and it banishes vice. Why is that good news? Well, have you ever asked yourself, why can't I just get rid of this sin? Well, you know God can get rid of this sin if He wanted to now. He leaves us in this world to be sanctified, to conquer sin, to fight against sin. But He can and He will get rid of all sin at once. And so that is good news. This is the answer to the question in Psalm 15.1, who shall dwell on your holy 
hill and you understand that in this life only Christ can. But in that life, He's not only making us right in His courtroom, He's making us good. He's making us holy. He's going to make us without sin. He's going to make us perfectly good, loving good, seeing holiness and happiness as the same goal, that we will love and desire and do only that which is morally excellent and pure. Now, there's an objection here to glorification, this language. Doesn't Isaiah 48, 11 distinctly say, my glory I will not give to another? How can the Christian be glorified? I thought we're supposed to glorify only God. Only God receives glory. Well, in that place in Isaiah 48 or other passages you could consider in the Psalms, you know, unto you be glory. You know, you could consider a couple passages. But when you look at those passages, the giving of His glory specifically only means the splitting of credit or greatness or ascribing to some creature what is true only of God. That's what's being restricted. But the giving of, or the, what I say in the notes there, the gracious participation. So in uh, 2 Peter 1.4, when Peter talks about partaking of the divine nature, we don't become God, but we, uh, as Lewis said in one of his essays, bathe in his glory. That we're saturated in his glory. In other words, we reflect his glory. But now we reflect his glory perfectly in a way that's fitting for creatures. And another way to say it, this goes all the way back to week one, when we talked about to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And we made a distinction between the extrinsic glory of God versus the intrinsic glory of God. The intrinsic glory of God, his glory that he has in himself, cannot be added to, cannot be taken away. We cannot contribute to his glory. So why do we speak in the world of glorifying God, bringing glory to God, and so forth. That's his extrinsic glory, that he communicates to the creature freely. He doesn't have to. And, of course, you don't become his intrinsic glory. But you do become his extrinsic glory in a way that is fitting for a creature. You remain a creature, but perfectly reflecting his glory. And you see that in passages like I mentioned Romans 8, but also 1 Corinthians 2, 7, that these truths, these glorious gospel truths are communicated to us from before the foundation of the world, not just our salvation, but these truths are given to us from before the foundation of the world. And there it says, for your glory, for my glory, for your glorification. That's the extrinsic glory. These truths are shaping you. They're not just sanctifying you. You don't just arrive at heaven half-baked in glory. When you see him, you, these truths will have shaped you into perfect glory, creaturely, creaturely, not God's glory. Um, there's a lot there. There's also vindication. Vindication is our third point. The answer continues, we shall be two things on the day of judgment, openly acknowledged and acquitted. So let me briefly explain. First, God himself will acknowledge us. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But also we will be acquitted at the final bench of judge, uh, justice. You know, there's passages like Romans 2, not 14, 13, thank you. Uh, Romans 2, 13, just right before it, it becomes a battleground text. Uh, Roman Catholics, of course, like to use that almost, almost, almost as much as James 2. James 2, so annoying. I just saw it again yesterday. You know, James 2, James contradicts Paul. Are you a Bible-believing Christian? Well, I'd rather not talk about that. Well, I didn't, you didn't need to because the moment you said that, you just told me everything I need to know about your view of Scripture. You think that verses, those are our verses, those are your verses, okay? You just told me everything I need to know. No, James 2 goes together with Romans 3. Here, James is using justify to mean evidenced, showed, and he makes that very clear. He says, you show me this by this, I will show you. God doesn't need a better view. It's not using justify in that way. It's meaning prove out to us, to men. Okay, so that's for starters. So when you go to Romans 2.13, the same thing's happening. So it's not just Roman Catholics. Um, N.T. Wright and um, New Perspectives on Paul and other views that will talk about a final justification. Okay, what do you mean by that? Do you mean James 2, but now applied to the heavenly courtroom? Then that'd be fine. Or do you mean that you're splitting 
the legal declaration and the ground of your righteousness between what Christ has done and, so, and stuff you do. Because if you mean that, you're not going to pass on Judgment Day. You will have an imperfect righteousness still. Um, so we, we have to get a... So this vindication, this acquittal, is still an acquittal 100% on the merit of Christ alone. Um, but when we do get there, when that ruling happens, there will be no more debate about James 2 and Romans 2.13. There will be no more debate about justification. It will be very clear the role that good works played in the Christian life, and they do play a role. It will not be any merit on our part in justification, but there will nonetheless be reward of that which glorified God. Remember Matthew 5, 16, that men will see your good works and give glory, not to you, to your Father who is in heaven. So again, it's a matter of the courtroom versus God's house. In the courtroom, there's only one work, and that's Christ's work. In his house, there's all, it's filled with works. It's filled with good, exciting things for you to do to bear fruit to God and give glory to God in this life. So, of course, there's, a, there's works all over the Christian life. It's a good thing. What were you planning on doing? Nothing? Sitting on your couch? <laughs> that's, that's not Christianity. That's not life. Um, Matthew 25, 23, his master said to him, this is on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. We'll get into this a little, well, as much as you want to, on the Q&A night. But read Jonathan Edwards, the book um, Charity and Its Fruit. The last chapter is a sermon he preached called Heaven, a World of Love. And in that sermon, Edwards talked about different degrees of reward and different capacities in souls to glorify God in heaven. Different degrees of holiness in the saints. What's your first thought? What? I thought there'd be no more competition in heaven. Stop. You just loaded in a premise that Jonathan Edwards did not. When you heard diversity and inequality, you immediately thought competition, strife, not fair, etc. I mean, are you jealous of the sun and the stars? Are you, wh- there will be no occasion for that. We'll get into this, but Edwards has a lot of great statements about why that will make you infinitely happier than you could be in the world that you would construct, where everybody would just be a, a carbon cutout, a robot, or a... You know, just everybody like everybody else possessing the same thing as everybody else and nothing really worth talking about or doing because everybody's reduced to nothingness, if that's what your idea of fairness is. But we'll talk about that. Heavenly vindication means that the cause of Christ through you in this life will be proven to have been the only thing worth living for and more. Psalm 37, 6, he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. So you'll be vindicated. The persecution, the grief that you took for being a Christian, it will be vindicated through you. It's not a vindication of my own private vengeance and my own turf that was offended. and oh, Not that vindication. Christ will be vindicated in you, His cause. And in that, you will be vindicated. This has specific application to all the occasions in life where we were maligned or mistreated in some way for being believers. Think of where Peter says in 1 Peter 2.12, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, what does Peter mean? Does he mean that all those unbelievers who now malign you will do so willingly and be glad that they have to confess that you were right and that your cause was just? Maybe. Or maybe he's talking about a group that's 50-50. Or maybe 100% the other way. That all these people, just like those in Philippians 2, that every knee shall bow. So unwillingly. Or maybe it splits. A lot of these people will get saved. And then on the day of vindication... Like the thief on the cross, they'll realize that they had such and such a life making fun of Christians, but by God's mercy, He brought them in. But either way, you will be 100% vindicated on that day. 
And then the last section is the beatific vision that refers to the perfected experience or sight of God that the saints will enjoy in glory. And there's main texts on this, one we already looked at, 1 John 3, 2, might be a lot of people's go-to text for it. But here's some other ones. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. John 17, 24, this is Jesus praying to the Father. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Now stop right there. Matthew 5, 8 is a promise, and John 17, 24 is a prayer. So if Jesus promises it and Jesus prays for it, do you think it's going to happen? Yes. There's a lot we don't know about what this will look like, but will we in some way absolutely see God? Yes, because He promises it and He prays for it. Revelation 21, 23, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. But here's the challenging question. How can that be? Because the Scriptures say that God dwells in unapproachable light. 1 Timothy 6, 16, he says, whom no one has ever seen or can see. And you see that in Exodus 32, 14, and John 1, 18, and a few other places as well. Although in John 1.18, same kind of thing. There's always a solution in these passages, and Christ happens to be the solution. Um, in the prayer, by the way, the prayer was that they would see me, see my glory. Of course, Jesus is God. So how do we balance that out? Um, we have to confess the deepest of mysteries here. It has to remain true that no creature can behold the essence of God, at least in the sense of His infinite fullness of being, that is by definition impossible, and that remains impossible. By definition, the very nature of it, it is impossible for a creature to take in all that God is. You might remember the angels in Isaiah 6. They had the wings, two to cover their eyes, two to cover their feet, and so on. Um, purity of being by itself does not solve all that has all that's in mind by not being able to see God. Even the greatest of theologians were not settled on every detail here. There's the question of whether this sight could be of the Father only, sorry, of the Father or, or of the Son only. And if the latter, the idea would be that our sight can only ever be mediated according to His human nature, and that's the means by which we see the Father. We don't know. John Owen argued that it can only be in the face of Jesus Christ. He argues that from 2 Corinthians 4.6. And as to the extent of seeing God, Turretin acknowledges, quote, debate about whether the blessed will see God's essence immediately or see some effulgence of God. So there's sort of a foretaste of that with what Moses did see, that God passed by him. And of course, that would only be a type and a shadow. It might be a greater sight, but gives you a clue as to the problem and the solution. Becoming like Christ at glorification, last point, in one's whole being implies the same for your knowledge, because your knowledge is an aspect of your being. And so we often speak of seeing things as God sees them on that day. And of course, that too means in a way fitting for a creature. But Paul says, and this is our last verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So let me open it up to questions, comments, or anything else. Yep. So this may be too much of a thing to cover now, but just to clarify what I think you said about the thousand year reign, the first resurrection, etc. Yeah. So the first resurrection could refer to um, uh, being born again. Mm -hmm. That means we're living in the thousand year mm -hmm. reign, which is figurative, as yep. I understand what, what you, your position is. Yeah. If that's the case, according to Revelation 20, Satan is bound mm -hmm. so that he can't deceive the nations. But it seems pretty obvious that he is deceiving the nations. So let me challenge that. Uh, he's bound, Matthew 12, when Jesus bound the demons. And he, his response to them when they accused him of doing that by the power of Satan was that, but if I cast out 
demons uh, by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And that was a sign of the kingdom that he bound the strong man, is the way he said it there. Um, his throne and reign clearly began in Acts 2. Peter says that that's the fulfillment of the Davidic throne. So the part I want to challenge is the idea that he can't deceive the nations in any sense or that that's the meaning of deceive the nations when he's loosed at the end to deceive the nations. Remember the sermon last week? and the, Yeah, it was last week. Um, we often don't appreciate how when Christ came, his light went out to the Gentiles and he freed the nations from the domain of the devil. And so the nations refers to the Gentiles. And what he did in his first coming was that he broke that dominion of Satan over the nations. Revelation 20 is not suggesting that the demons or devils, because they're bound and because they've been punished in some immediate sense, as Jude 6 and 2 Peter 2 also give credence to, that they do not deceive in any way. Let's also remember that chains are figurative as well. That when he's cast out of heaven, Revelation 12 talks about how he is defeated by what the, 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 the son who was born to, and the woman represents the church. He's then caught up to heaven, and then he then for a time goes after what amounts to the church during that same period of time. So Revelation 20 is not trying to suggest that he can't do, it's not this all or nothing thing being uh, communicated. Um, there's a there's a radical difference between his deceit over the nations before Christ came and then at the end when he's loosed to deceive the nations. One more thing on that. How do we know that that has not happened in what you're referring to in the modern world? That this could be the end of the millennial period in which he's been loosed, yeah. So there's an unpre so we can, we can see a difference between the sense in which Christianity was spreading throughout the world from the time of Christ to the early, early, the late modern era through American and, and English um, missionary efforts and others versus something that happened starting in the Enlightenment but really hitting in the 20th century with totalitarian regimes where there's this, where now we see it coming to the full, where there's such a deception that no pagan would have ever fallen for in the ancient world. Complete madness. Um, that's kind of where my prophecy charts end. I don't want to speculate beyond that, but those are a couple points to keep in mind about Revelation 20 and how to take the sense of deceiving the nations and being bound and so on. Any other quick question? I know it's quarter after. We can take another. Uh, yeah. I'll take two. Sorry, am I understanding you're saying that the rapture and the last day are one and the same? Yeah. Um, how does that... How then does uh, Matthew 24, 40, where it talks about the two men, one taken and one left, how does that map into that? Perfectly. Um, he's taken in, so I have no problem using the word rapture. So the elect are taken out of the way, and 1 Thessalonians, uh, sorry, 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through uh, 10 tells us exactly why and what is happening. They're being removed from the way so that Christ only destroys the enemies. And they are coming, uh, R.C. Sproul uses the imagery in 1 Thessalonians 4 of the Roman general coming back. And so Paul's borrowing from this imagery where everybody in the city is coming out to meet him and to join him in this procession. And so that's what the trumpets are all about. That's what the angels are going uh, before him about. And the expression is used by Paul there that the saints are uh, there to marvel at him. So marvel at what? Him destroying all of his enemies. They meet the Lord in the air. So that's the rapture part. Is that a thing? Yes. So I think a lot of people, unfortunately, a lot of post and amillennial Calvinists will sometimes just like to shock people and say, there's no rapture. Well, no, there's a rapture, but it's, it's the same event getting them out of the way so that Jesus destroys his enemies and saves um, his people from that, from his wrath. So it's all one moment, all one momentary event. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, the, uh, when you say six clear facts about the hour of Christ's return. Or time. Yeah. The, one of the things that we must understand that gets Christ up off of the throne, mm -hmm. there, there's two things that have to be met. 
one, all that the Father gives Christ mm -hmm. has happened. Yeah. So the last believer is one sign that Christ will get up and return. And of course the other is making it, the enemies his, his footstool. Mm -hmm. And those are the two signs that we tend to miss. Yeah. That second one especially, or maybe both of them, is part, I'll say this real fast and I'll pray, is part of what the post-millennialists would point to. And they would say that, and a lot of post-millennialists will say, I don't mind treating it figurative as long as that that brain touches down and advances. And I agree with the post-millennialist on that. I just don't think that I have to take the thousand years literally to do that. That's why I think post-millennialists and homilies should just get together and just agree that they're both post-millennial with respect to where the return of Christ is, and they should both be awe with respect to having to count. <laughs> and then they should agree on everything else, which, anyway, I don't want to start a fight on that one. <laughs> that won't include the Westminster West, uh, Escondido guys. They won't agree with that. But the rest of us are millennials and post millennials, I think, can get together and should and uh, realize we should be talking the same game. Anyway, I'll pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this study, and we pray that you would work this grace in our heart to, to be those people that Hebrews 9.28 talks about, that, that Christ is coming back for people that eagerly are expecting him. So I pray that you would work that in our hearts and that you would help us see the good news of glorification, of resurrected bodies and being done with sin and seeing you in all your glory forever. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Oh, so you're saying use those lyrics. 